Welcome, welcome everybody. My name is Adam Gray Carr. I'm the Dean of the Australian National Institute for Public Policy. No, it was at the top of the previous slide. And uh, in, within that we have uh, H.C. Coombs Policy Forum that I'll tell you a little about in a moment. In welcoming you here today, I would like, first of all, to pay my respects to the traditional owners of this land, the Ngunnawal people, and to acknowledge their culture and their long traditions, <coughs> the cultural and long traditions of this ancient people. We're gathered here today to uh, examine the report that's recently been prepared by the Productivity Commission to look at uh, the opportunity for national consultation on bilateral and regional trade agreements. This fits very well with our Australian National Institute of Public Policy, which is a strategic alliance between the Commonwealth and the Australian National University. The ANU and the government have agreed on a set of shared, of shared goals, goals about improving the connection between the public sector and the best in public policy research from within Australia and across the world. It's about fostering relationships, building an evidence base, and bringing together, essentially, people in government, people in academia, and adding value to the knowledge base on both sides. The Coombs Policy Forum is essentially the think tank within the Australian National Institute of, for Public Policy. Its task is to integrate and communicate relevant policy and knowledge, and I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Mark Matthews, the Executive Director of the Coombs Policy Forum, who's here today. This exercise today is not just a talk fest, it's an analysis, it's an exchange, and what we hope through the Coombs Policy Forum is to work with those of you who are interested in working out the next steps to continue to add value. We're very honoured to be meeting here today uh, at the Crawford School. The Crawford School is part of the ANU College of Asia and the Pacific, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome the Dean of the ANU College of Asia and the Pacific, <coughs> Professor Andrew McIntyre. Uh, Adam, thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, uh, warm welcome. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be uh, part of the kickoff process uh, for this afternoon's uh, uh, events, uh, in part because this is an early rollout of, uh, of all sorts of exciting things that are going to be coming through the HC Coombs Forum, uh, and in part just because of the sheer uh, importance uh, of the issues uh, that are on the table this afternoon uh, and the significance of this, um, uh, of this draft report from the, uh, from the Productivity Commission. The whole question of uh, bilateral uh, and regional trade agreements is just really important for Australia uh, and for this part of the world generally. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's not as sexy as it is significant and it gets, accordingly, much less attention than in policy terms it deserves. And that's why I think uh, this, uh, this draft report uh, is really important for us. And there's a whole bunch of issues here that have been sitting around for a number of years, uh, and this is the first time they're getting exposed to the sort of um, uh, systemic, uh, 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 robust uh, analysis that are the hallmarks uh, of the Productivity Commission. So I really uh, um, uh, commend Gary and his colleagues uh, uh, for all, uh, all, that, um, uh, all that they've achieved here. Um, uh, Australia, uh, along with trends in the rest of the world, has been uh, doing more uh, and is doing more, uh, being more active uh, in the uh, uh, bilateral and regional uh, trade agreement space. But what we need to be thinking hard about, and this is an issue of strategic significance for us in terms of our overall foreign economic policy, uh, is, is what we want to get out of these things. How we best configure them. Now there's all sorts of issues that, um, uh, that will be picked up on in the discussion this afternoon about approaches to trade agreements, about the design of trade agreements. Uh, for now, uh, I just pull one issue out, just one that really caught my attention when I was flipping through the draft report. 
Uh, and that was the, uh, the, the dot point tucked away in there saying that um, uh, in terms of the evidence that's come before the Commission, uh, so far there's relatively little evidence of commercial benefit uh, flowing from these, uh, from these agreements. That's not a small point, or potentially that's not a small point. Uh, and it fits with some other things that we're picking up from analysis uh, elsewhere in the region. Um, and, so, uh, and I think it really brings us back to the question of how we tie in and weigh up economic considerations and foreign policy considerations. And I'm hoping we're going to be hearing uh, something about that uh, as the afternoon goes on. So just, just to, uh, by way of a segue you know, in the direction of Gary, um, uh, um, I think Productivity Commission has done us a real service uh, with this report, uh, and I think we're going to get all sorts of interest in the debate coming from it. I look forward to listening to it. Thanks, Andrew, and uh, as part of the uh, blending of academia and government, I'd like to introduce uh, Gary Banks, uh, Chairman of the Productivity Commission. Well, thanks very much, uh, Adam uh, and Andrew, and also Peter Drysdale, um, who was uh, important in getting this uh, uh, going today. And I apologise for being late. I, I made the mistake of going to the location of the first such forum, uh, which is, as you know, quite a long way in the wind from here. Uh, well, look, the Commission's always had strong uh, links with the Australian National University. Um, once upon a time, we were only based in Canberra, and the ANU was our university. Uh, we're now also in Melbourne, and, and we, we've spread the link somewhat uh, with academia, but those links are very important to us in terms of collaboration and participation uh, in, in our work, and indeed uh, in staffing the organisation, including our visiting researchers who come from academia. If anything, I think those links are getting stronger. Um, and the Australian National Institute for Public Policy, I think, is a great idea and an important mechanism for strengthening those links, not only with us, but with other uh, parts of the public sector and, and more broadly. Uh, and indeed, this Coombs Policy Forum uh, is a great way of discussing uh, the issues uh, that are important to us all. I, I, as I said, I went to Craig Emerson's inaugural uh, presentation and and enjoyed that, and, and we're grateful for the opportunity to be um, the second uh, such uh, uh, forum. Well, um, as I said, this, this kind of forum is, is ideal for the Commission. Um, we do work which is uh, intended to get to the public. Um, we don't want any artificial barriers to it, so public fora such as this um, are ideal. We're not so keen on some of the commercial conferences that charge 4,000 bucks. Uh, for people to attend, they get us for free and they charge you $4,000 so I much prefer to, if you're going to get us for free that you go come here for free as well. Um, but also I have to say the quality of the audience is a bit better uh, in this kind of forum. <laughs> I knew you'd like that. <laughs> um, and that's important to us because consultation, uh, getting input and feedback on our work is a crucial part um, of what we do uh, in, in a way. Uh, in, in conjunction with the independence of the organisation um, and the in-depth research that it does, um, uh, defines uh, its contribution. Um, and I think that's, that's particularly important these days for focus groups, um, quick solutions and spin. Well, a key part of that process, of that consultation process for us, is the draft report, which is a way of, um, as I put it, stress testing uh, our ideas uh, not only with uh, the people who have a direct interest uh, uh, in the inquiry, the so-called stakeholders, but also the wider community and indeed um, uh, academic and, and other experts uh, who've done work in the area. And it makes our final report to government uh, all the more robust and useful and hopefully reliable with fewer unintended consequences uh, that otherwise might arise. And I should reassure you that the draft report process does influence uh, what we say. I, I've never seen a final report that hasn't been changed for the better uh, as a result of the feedback and interaction that we've received uh, in response to a draft uh, report. And I'm sure that's going to be the same uh, for this one as well. Um, all of our reports um, tend to be, the Commission reports that is, tend to be in areas that are significant uh, but are also quite complex and often politically contentious uh, 
and I think this particular subject matter fits the boat in, in, in all three respects. Um, as you know, Australia's traditional approach uh, to trade policy has typically been uh, a unilateral one. We've, we've reduced our trade bar uh, barriers for domestic reasons to enhance domestic economic performance. Uh, and then we've got credit for that through the WTO. It's been a win-win uh, for us, I think, domestically and for the reinforcement that the international um, uh, uh, reciprocal um, concessions have provided on top of those uh, for us. Uh, that's pretty much all changed since, the, uh, since about 2000 or 2001 and we've been heading much more in the direction of preferential uh, trade agreements. These have been quite controversial. You'll remember the, the big one uh, to start off with with the United States was, was quite uh, uh, controversial uh, with academics divided and other policy advisors divided and we had uh, quite a big debate. Well, we, we've uh, negotiated quite a few since then. Um, it's obviously a good time to have a stock take, uh, to think about how all that's going and where we should be going in the future. And that's what the draft report's intended to do. And, and I'm very pleased that we have this great opportunity to get feedback from you, which hopefully will make our final report all the stronger. So thank you very much. I look forward to your comments. Thanks, Gary. And uh, now to turn to the substance of today, I'd like to introduce Tom Compass, the uh, director of the Crawford School, who will share the next session. Thanks, Adam. Thank you very much. My name is Tom Compass, director of the Crawford School. It's my pleasure to, to uh, chair this first session, a session that looks at how the commission saw the report. Each speaker has promised to take about 10 minutes or so maybe a bit less in some cases, to uh, provide their reactions. So we can save plenty of time for questions from you. In fact, that's what we're looking forward to, or looking to that sort of interaction. I've been reminded that it's Chatham House rules here today. So if you are going to quote something in some, some public context, please get permission to do so. First up is Patricia Scott. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm delighted to be here and thank you, Peter, for making, uh, being, playing such an instrumental role in ensuring that we have this opportunity presented to you. And uh, we're presenting the draft recommendations of a draft report. And this study was commissioned by the Rudd government. Now, that might seem a long time ago, but uh, <laughs> there we are. The Commission was asked to examine and provide recommendations on bilateral and regional trade agreements. And this, unfortunately, has brought into existence yet another acronym. So occasionally you're going to hear us refer to the RTAs, Bilateral and Regional Trade Agreements. The Commission released its draft report the day before the election was called, when many other issues were swirling around in the media and grabbing people's attention. So there's a chance that you haven't actually flipped through our report or read the uh, great work done by Andy and the team, and I acknowledge the team as I go along. So if you haven't picked up a copy of the report, I think there were copies still out there as I came in, and it is available today in hard copy form, uh, and of course available from our website. As Gary explained, the draft report has been prepared for further public consultation and input, and we have specifically asked for further evidence to be made available to the Commission. And I'll return to the point uh, made that we have received relatively little evidence on commercial gains or losses arising from uh, bilateral and regional trade agreements. So to provide some context to the discussion, um, I've got in front of you a couple of graphs showing the growth in trade agreements internationally, both in number with, of course, more under negotiation. And in the amount of global trade between agreement partners, in the early 1960s, there were nine agreements in force, nine. On the latest count, 287 agreements have been notified to the WTO, with another 200 notifications of agreements under negotiation. 
In 2008, around half of global trade in goods was between trade agreement partners. <coughs> And this growth, of course, has led to substantial overlap and interlinkages between agreements. And as this diagram shows, for just the APEC economies. Over a large number of years, Australia had relatively few trading agreements. But in recent years, there has been a marked determination to strike agreements. Over the last seven years, the Australian Government has struck five agreements and has a long list of agreements under negotiation or where feasibility studies have been entered into. It is in this context that the Government commissioned this study, tasking us to examine, among other things, the impact of bilateral and regional trade agreements on trade and investment barriers and Australia's broader economic performance. The Commission has looked at agreements, particularly <laughs> preferential ones, and as with any policy analysis, has compared that to the other options available. More broadly, the Commission has determined that unilateral or non-discriminatory reforms are likely to offer the greatest benefits to Australia. I don't think that will shock you. And regionally and internationally, reform can be advanced through more broadly based mechanisms supported by domestic, trans tran domestic transparency. In looking specifically at pre pre preferential agreements, based on the evidence received and on our own analysis, and Paul will shortly go through the technical analysis undertaken in this draft study, the impact of preferential agreements, while positive, is limited. Other options may be more cost effective to advancing the government's ambitions. So if big RTAs have had a modest impact, the question then becomes what is the role for trade agreements? To look at this, we examined the various objectives put forward for trade agreements. Now, it didn't take us long to dismiss the mercantilist argument that exports for exports sake is a good idea. Some reasonable objectives are not appropriate for BRTAs, such as lowering our own barriers, we can get on and do that ourselves, or furthering our strategic, i.e. defence and diplomatic interests. Other objectives, such as regional integration, capacity building, are parallel to objectives in BRTAs of economic growth or trade liberalisation. And although they could be done outside BRTAs, they also could be usefully included in them. Given all of that, we thought that well-designed trade agreements are a feasible option for addressing some objectives, reducing barriers in other partner countries, promoting frameworks for trade and economic cooperation, and for locking in beneficial reforms. But this doesn't mean that we should continue on exactly the same course. The draft report states that the benefits of preferential trade agreements have been oversold, and that there is room for improvement in future agreements and in the process surrounding them. And I'll ask Andy now to take you through the draft recommendations. Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. So, um, recommendation number one, and let me stress that these recommendations, like the report itself, are draft recommendations. Also, for the purpose of the slide presentation, the recommendations have been somewhat abbreviated from what you'll actually find in the report. Now, this recommendation, which in its short form reads, where alternative channels are not practical, BRTA should favor non-discriminatory provisions, not inhibit other reforms. The recommendation arises out of recognition that non-preferential routes to trade liberalization might not be practicable, and that the BRTA route could provide opportunities that probably should not be missed in some cases. It's a realistic recommendation that recognizes that BRTAs are here to stay. We also wanted to signal in this recommendation that there are a number of aspects of bilateral regional trade agreements 
that can lend themselves to what some people call an open regionalism approach and thereby minimize discrimination against non-parties. During the initial part of the study, some of those we talked to suggested that the initiation of a BRTA negotiation could have the perverse, perverse effect of inhibiting trade liberalization or reform that might otherwise take place as people withhold perceived negotiating coin. And obviously, the potential for this problem needs to be evaluated at the start of the talks. And finally, the full text of this recommendation also suggests that there is a need for benefits assessment to be made through transparent and independent analysis uh, in the future. The second recommendation, which in its short form reads, while still complying with WTO requirements, Australia should adopt a more flexible approach to coverage of BRTAs. Let me start by saying that this is in no way a recommendation to leave agriculture out of a difficult negotiation with a partner like China or Japan. You could not do that and still satisfy WTO requirements to liberalize substantially all trade. Rather, what we're suggesting in this recommendation is that there could be more instances in the future where some aspects of a negotiation might be addressed in a staged fashion. Some might refer to a building agenda or a living agreement approach. The answer to this treatment of investment, for example, where changes in access are subject to a work program over several years, is an example of the kind of thing we had in mind with this recommendation. Now, some of our negotiating partners might not be immediately ready to countenance chapters in a BRTA on competition policy or government procurement. And in a worst case scenario, we could still negotiate a significant WTO consistent BRTA without such provisions. Alternatively, difficult areas might be taken up later through agreed subsequent stages to the negotiations. The downside risk in that type of flexibility, of course, is evident in how things have turned out in our agreement with Thailand, where foreseen subsequent negotiations have yet to materialize. Finally, it's entirely possible and within the rules of the WTO to contemplate, for example, a services only regional trade agreement, and that's also covered in the scope of this recommendation. Recommendation three in its short form reads that Australia should adopt the composite rules of origin model used in the ANSFTA for future agreements and advocate a waiver where tariff differences are small. Well, it goes without saying that many people don't like rules of origin, and they don't tire of reminding us that there are compliance costs associated with meeting these rules. In addition, it's clear that the rules adopted in some agreements, and not necessarily Australia's agreements, make taking advantage of the supposed liberalization problematic. At the same time, most countries don't seem to be willing to give the benefits of a BRTA to non-parties. So we have to recognize that under normal conditions, rules of origin are an inescapable part of BRTAs. In this context, it's clear that a flexible approach involving more than one rule can make life easier for business and increase the chances that the BRTA will be utilized by traders. And the answer to approach, offering both an RVC and CTC route to proving origin, is an approach we endorse in the draft report. Finally, we need to recognize that traders will not bother to make use of a BRTA if the advantage is very small, perhaps even less than their compliance costs. And with this in mind, we've suggested that Australia might explore negotiating partners' willingness to waive the applicability of a rule of origin if goods would otherwise enter at MFN tariffs of 5% or less. <coughs> Recommendation four. BRTA should not include matters that increase trade barriers, raise costs, or affect social policies without review of the implications and available options. <coughs> this recommendation obviously arises out of Australia's experience with provisions like the copyright extension obligations of the agreement with the United States. The full text of the recommendation doesn't say that we should not, doesn't say that we should necessarily rule out BRTA provisions that might raise costs or affect social policies, but it does say that we should be cautious and make sure that we go into the deal with our eyes wide open. Specific areas where caution should be exercised include intellectual property rights, 
labor standards and uh, environmental and possibly environmental protection standards that could give rise to protectionism. On the other hand, the draft report also signals the need for a cautious approach to reacting to demands for untoward protection by local providers, for example, of audiovisual services, especially where the material protected has nothing to do with culture. The fifth recommendation says that for dispute settlement, Australia should be cognizant of the capacity of partner countries' legal systems. Arguably, this is a recommendation already being followed by Australian negotiators. For example, in our agreements with developing countries where legal systems may be judged to be relatively underdeveloped, we often find that cases can be, very, can be referred to third parties for resolution. Some of our agreements have investor state dispute settlement provisions involving third parties and others do not. Some agreements, like the ANSPTA, even have a mixed approach to dealing with dispute settlement. The draft report also suggests that in order to be equitable and fair, foreign investors or other businesses of the other BRTA party should not be giving protections not available to local residents. And where there are investor state dispute settlement provisions, we suggest that they be reviewed from time to time to ensure they're consistent with evolving best practice. The sixth recommendation reads that the scrutiny of potential impacts of prospective agreements should be improved. First, before negotiations with more focus on the choice of trading partner, potential impacts, expected time frames, and the relative merits of alternatives. And secondly, before sign off with independent and transparent analysis of the likely impacts of the text. This is a complicated but important recommendation. To start with, the before negotiations, in the, to start with the before negotiations aspect, we heard in the course of the first part of our study that many stakeholders felt that the choice of trading partner often related to the last country the trade minister visited. That feasibility studies routinely overestimated the likely positive impact of proposed agreements. And that getting into a long running negotiation like that that we have with China could do our relationship more harm than good. That said, if you ask most stakeholders which countries we should be negotiating BRTAs with, most would list our most important trading partners, ASEAN, China, Japan, Korea, and the United States. Chile wouldn't make the list of what's the harm. Feasibility studies could certainly be made on the basis of more realistic assumptions, but because you don't want to tip your hand to the other side in the negotiations, those assumptions probably need to be plugged into the model after the talks are finished and before the deal is signed. Which brings me to the second part of the recommendation, the advisability of pre-sign-off analysis. Rather than basing an analysis on what you hope will be in an agreement, why would you not want to analyze what you actually achieved in the agreement? It was silly to think that the ASFTA would free up Australian sugar shipments to the United States, or that Australia at the time would give up the wheat board single desk in that agreement. Of course, even a post-negotiation pre-sign-off analysis would need to make certain assumptions that might not turn out to eventuate in the real world. <clears throat> For instance, you can negotiate the opening of a government procurement market, but that doesn't mean companies will be successful in selling. The other thing that a pre-sign-off analysis would give you is an opportunity to assess the degree to which an agreement might have provisions that fly in the face of some of the other recommendations we suggest, like avoiding dramatically increased administrative and compliance costs. Last recommendation. <coughs> DFAT should publish estimates of the expenditure incurred in negotiating bilateral, regional, and multilateral trade agreements. The cost of negotiating a trade agreement is certainly no measure of whether the agreement is worthwhile. Take the WTO, for example. The Uruguay round lasted effectively from when it was first mooted in 1982 until the end of 1993. That's 11 years of flying scores of Australian negotiators halfway across the world to one of the most expensive destinations on the face of the globe. But I would bet that most people would say the Uruguay round was well worth it, no matter what the cost. At the same time, in the interest of transparency, it would be interesting to know what kind of cost is entailed in trade negotiations 
like the long-running Doha round or some of the bilateral and regional deals Australia has been involved in over the years. Now, when DFAT officials were requested as a part of this study to provide estimates of the cost of trade agreement negotiations, they replied, and their reply is in the draft report, that currently they're unable to do so given the policy integration in the department where trade is mainstreamed across the department's operations. Also, I'm pretty sure that DFAT currently doesn't operate like a law firm where employees are tasked with recording which client they're working for over a given number of hours. So from my perspective, the DFAT response is completely understandable. At the same time, in the interest of transparency, we thought it would be worth recommending that in the future, DFAT find a way to organize itself and its work where estimates of the costs of trade negotiation might be developed and published. The issue should be kept in perspective, however. As I said earlier, the cost of doing a deal is no way to measure its worth. And the other point to keep in mind is that there are costs to the government even of unilateral liberalization. Think of the tariff revenue foregone when our import duty on passenger motor vehicles was cut in half this past January. Well, that wraps up my immediate contributions to this discussion. And before I hand the floor to Paul Gretton, I'd just like to say that I'm sure I speak for the team and the commission more generally when I say we would very much welcome your reactions to the draft recommendations. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm just I'm going to speak briefly now on some of the analytical work that the Commission uh, has done as part of this exercise. Um, the, the analytical work and the uh, nature of quantitative modelling is used to complement other information that we receive through our submissions to the inquiry and, and studies that are available to us to inform the Commission on the preparation of its recommendations. It's one, it's, it's one part of a larger body of information we use. Um, now, in our terms of reference, we're asked to report on the impacts of uh, trade, bilateral and regional trade agreements on Australia's economic performance. Uh, that is um, a, a, a large question and on one hand it could be interpreted to look at the individual impacts of each agreement and all the subtleties of those agreements. Um, as you'll know, as you each know, that uh, a number of our agreements are only recently signed and perhaps at this stage it's too early to understand all the implications of those agreements, particularly taking into account of the fact that we've had the lead up to the global financial crisis and its aftermath. But what we, what we have been able to do is look at, um, look, take two streams of work to look at aspects of um, Australia's agreements and also the experience of uh, agreements signed by other countries around the world that are long standing. And to do that, we use two streams of analysis. In one stream of analysis, we used a, what we might call an ex ante CGE modelling approach to analyse for what we termed a small country and a large country, and we, we don't need to be actually specific to this in a conceptual sense, uh, the impacts of Australia going into agreements with those countries, such, such countries. The other approach that we have adopted um, was an ex post analysis, or an econometric analysis, looking at data going from the early 1970s to 2008, and the changes in trade over that period and re relating that, those changes to changes in factors that might influence trade, thinking of GDP, closeness and so forth, but also bringing, in, bringing to bear the entering into force of agreements. And in this exercise, we looked at about 30 agreements entering into force over, over this uh, uh, extended period. Now, through the, I, I think it's fair to say that no single stream of work can give uh, give all the answers to the, the question of what is the impacts or the economic impacts of trade agreements on, on a, an economy. But, but the two pieces of analysis can give you a, a number of insights which could guide public policy. Now I mean the first and somewhat rather obvious one is that the actual impacts are likely to depend on the nature of the agreement. And what we mean by that is that some agreements can differ in their design with respect to the preferential arrangements, some agreements uh, might form custom unions, might be in the form of custom unions such as the, uh, the, the EU, others might be in the form of preferential arrangements such as NAFTA and the CEO. And in addition we have uh, the 
arrangement which the APEC arrangement, which mightn't be an agreement in the, in the sense some people see them, but is an arrangement between countries to collectively reduce tariffs over a period of time. Um, secondly, uh, <coughs> what we can also observe, both through our uh, SANTI or CGE analysis and our uh, ex post analysis or econometric analysis, that it's pretty clear that preferential agreements are in, uh, increase bilateral trade between partner countries. And I think this, uh, that, would be, that would conform to expectations. Uh, but, um, now, but at the same time, what, what the analysis is also showing is that the agreements are diverting trade, particularly when there's pre trade preferences, from uh, non-partner countries. Now, and the extent, of diverge, the extent of divergence can come close, but not always, offset the extent of trade creation. So for some agreements, perhaps, which have got strong preferential arrangements, uh, the impact on trade can be fairly line ball. And taking one step further, if the impact on trade is fairly line ball, then the impact on in income, country income, is also <coughs> likely, to be, likely to be close or likely to be small. Now, and now, but in addition, where there's non-preferential arrangements, or there's fairly, uh, you know, the preferential arrangements, you might say, are loose, then there's more scope for flexibility. And in those cases, what you do find in the quantitative analysis is that the the intensity of the trade diversion is much less. Now, over the, the next point is thinking of preferential trading agreements, often, and this has been mentioned earlier in the session, that their uh, rules of origin and other regulations are associated with the, the supporting of the preferences, the trade preferences. And those rules of origin can increase <coughs> compliance costs, but they also are regarded, and particularly if they're more res restrictive or stringent, as increasing the costs of business as, they, as there's input uh, input substitute, as businesses substitute inputs uh, into their production package to meet the requirements of the agreement. Each of those things is cost increasing. Um, so th there is a case where you might look at the, the arrangements in terms of the, the general tariff preferences, but the actual final economic impacts is modified by the, uh, by the regulatory environment in which the agreements um, are brought into force. Overall, it's fair to say that preferential, our analysis, both our econometric analysis and our CGE analysis, would suggest that the uh, economic gains from preferential agreements are modest, uh, whereas um, compared to alternative forms of trade liberalisation. Now, what, um, rather than try and attempt to report all our quantitative work, I'd just like to go to one table which tries to uh, uh, elaborates on this point and puts, the, uh, puts some of the quantitative work into context. Now, obviously, for people who are familiar with economic modelling, um, all model results are a product of their assumptions, and uh, while we can demonstrate differences of orders of magnitude, it's very rarely, to very rarely to postulate that each number is exactly right. But what you can say fairly carefully from this analysis, which looks at uh, a CG, CG analysis of Australia signing a preferential agreement with a small country, going through to the removal of tariffs in all countries around the world, that there's a clear gradation. Um, if the removal, this analysis suggests that the removal of tariffs around the world would raise world production or GD uh, gross product by about 1%, you know, 0.94 according to that number, that estimate. Um, but if we sign an agreement, perhaps with a small country, and we've, there's a number of small countries we've signed agreements with, you might say Chile, Thailand, um, uh, and so on, but the possible impact on GDP is modest. And I suppose that when you think of it in that, that, to that extent, uh, what you might find is that perhaps from a commercial sense, the, any, as, the, as, these, as the effects of the agreement might flow through the economy, those effects would also be modest. But what we see as we move along is that when, if Australia undertakes unilateral reform, um, in other words, if we uh, 
the, remove the tariffs, our own tariffs, that takes us well on the way towards uh, achieving what might be achieved if there's global um, liberalisation. Now clearly the Australian unilateral case is achievable through our own policy mechanisms and I think when you look at the report you'll see that sympathy reflected in the, in the discussion. Um, there's one curiosity that's uh, injected between the Australian unilateral case and the stylized, uh, oh, sorry, the world case, and that's what we call the stylized APEC case. And think of the Bogor Declaration, which was an undertaking of the members of APEC at the time to eliminate tariff t uh, protection over, over a period. Um, and what we find there is that that um, is entails liberalisation by some of Australia's major trading partners and it also entails liberalisation by Australia. And that takes us, when we get some kind of coalition there, it takes us well on our way to uh, what, you might, um, what, what you might achieve if the world, if there was liberalisation around the world. And of course, as, you know, as everybody would know, liberalisation you know, of all countries in the world, like with respect to tariffs and other measures, would be probably fair to say it's a fair way off. Um, but the, um, when we think of the APEC arrangement, which has is, is, is clearly de delivered some benefits, I think, in our assessment, and Australian liberalisation, they are, you might say, closer to home and within policy, ma uh, within policy making, uh, within the bounds of policy achievement. Um, so I think on that, I'd perhaps, um, I'd like just to say, well, um, well, through this work, we've tried to give an idea that would, some ideas in a quantitative sense that would support the Commission's recommendations and analysis. Thank you. Um, so, just um, to uh, reiterate some of our key messages um, unilateral or Non-discriminatory reforms are likely to offer the greatest benefits to Australia. The likely benefits of preferential agreements have been oversold and expectations have been raised too high. <laughs> Improvements are needed to the independence, transparency and timing of the RTA assessments. Um, I know Tom's just about to take control of the lectern, but we would welcome your comments today and questions and your written inputs by the 10th of September. <laughs> 10th of September. Our final report will be made available to the government, wherever they are, on the 27th of November and will be released to the public thereafter. Yes. So thank you.